Hi, thanks for joining me for this on fire program uh, recorded for you. Uh, my name is Sarah Wolf. I work for Hendricks County Parks and Recreation, and we conducted a recent prairie burn at McLeod Nature Park near North Salem, Indiana. And I'm sure we'll have some questions about why we burn prairies. And I thought maybe I would help answer those questions by this little presentation. So if you have questions, feel free to ask those and I will answer them as best as I can. So today I'm gonna to cover why and how we do prescribed burns, some alternatives for prescribed burns, and then talk a little bit about smoky bear and fire suppression. Let's clarify a term real quick. So some people will use the term prescribed burn with the term controlled burn and use those terms interchangeably. I like to use the term prescribed burn because it's kind of like a doctor writing prescription for you when you're sick. We are writing a prescription to improve the health of our prairie and sometimes forests. But won't the gra prairie grasses take a long time to recover? We get that question a lot. Let's take a look at some pictures I took from the last time we had a prairie burn at McLeod Nature Park. We burned last on March 28th, 2016. And I took pictures about one week from each other from the same spot so you can see how long or not long it takes for the prairie to look like it's recovered. So this first picture is taken about a week after the prairie burn. So it's a little dark, a uh, little sort of burnt looking ground, um, but let's see how long it takes or doesn't take. So I'm just gonna scroll through these pictures here. So this picture was taken one month after the prairie burn does not take long for the grass to recover, especially in the spring when we have nice warm rains and warm temperatures coming on. So the, the grass will sprout quicker in the springtime because the ground is dark and it's black. Just like if you wore a dark colored t-shirt out in the summer, uh, you get warmer faster. So it's easier for the grass to sprout and the wildflowers. So this here is two months after the burn. You can't see any burnt ground at all, can you? The only reason you would know that a burn happened is because it's healthier and it looks better than it would have if we had not done a burn. So it does not take very long to, to quote, recover. There was three months after the burn and it just keeps going into the summer. You'll see our summer flowers coming on there. And here we have four months after the burn. So it does not take long to recover. Sometimes people think it takes a very long time to recover, but it does not. But why do fires work in prairies? Well, part of the answer is because grass grows from a point at or below the soil surface as shown in this picture. This is why mowing your yard works, because if, if you mowed your yard and it would die every time, that wouldn't work. Trees grow differently than grass does though. Trees grow from the tips of the branches. These growing points are called meristems. And because grass starts growing underneath or right at the soil surface, it start, grass starts growing as soon as the fire has passed, as if nothing had happened. It's kind of the same reason you can cut your hair. If you just cut off the growing part of the hair, uh, you can your hair will grow back. Trees don't work the same way as grass and hair does. Prairies actually need fire. Fires release nutrients for the plants. The ash from the fire is actually fertilizer for the plants. Fires kill trees and shrubs that would take over without fire. Without doing some management of uh, prairies, forests will return and take over. So we have to maintain those prairies so that we have those wildflowers and tall grasses to enjoy. 
prairie plants, they also sprout faster in blackened soil that is warmed by the sun. So it actually makes it easier for them to grow in the springtime. Fires are useful and historical. So lightning has started many fires in the prairies of the West. Native Americans used um, burning for, of prairies and forests for different reasons. Sometimes they would use um, burning to drive game. They would also use it to improve grazing for their horses. They might use it to clear areas around camp to watch for enemies. And sometimes they would use fire to fight their enemies. Pioneers also used burning of prairies and forests for um, planting, preparing the area for planting. They'd also use it to eliminate pests. So it's easier to see if a mountain lion or a, a wolf back in the day were uh, sneaking up on your chickens. So prescribed burns have to be done in the right way to be done safely. There's proper training that's required for people to conduct prescribed burns. A lot of planning has to go into the fire uh, plans and they have to have proper clothing and tools. So some of the planning considerations are the humidity can't be too high or too low. It can't be below 25% humidity because then the, the prairie grasses or the forest will just um, take off like a, um, it'll be dangerous. <laughs> and uh, having humidity too high will make it so that it's um, hard to burn. We need to have consistent wind from a consistent direction. Uh, you want to have gentle wind to help the flames go in the direction that you're, you want them to. You don't want to have the wind shift right um, during a burn, and I'll talk a little bit about why you don't want to have that happen. So you need a consistent direction, and you need the air temperature not too hot. So even just burning a prairie with grasses, standing too close to the fire, even like 10 feet away, is almost too hot because of the, the heat produced from the fire. So timing of the burns is important. You need to avoid critical breeding times. So there are ground nesting birds who have eggs and nests on the ground. There are turtles that lay eggs in the ground. So timing of it is very important. You don't wanna to go too late into the summer or um, because of these animals here. And timing also goes into the weather considerations too. So you need proper clothing. So here I am at a different burn. This, um, the clothing I'm wearing uh, is, is called Nomex. It's treated with a chemical to make it fire um, retardant or resistant. It, it will catch on fire if it gets too hot. Um, but you wear this over your clothes uh, because you do want that little extra insulation. This is not like the heavy padded uh, insulated clothing that firefighters for, for houses will wear that's too heavy to wear when you're out fighting uh, wildland fires or doing prescribed burns uh, in your park. So you do have to wear proper gear so that you're protected uh, because it is of course very hot, like I said. Uh, you have to wear uh, boots and gloves and a helmet with eye protection. You also wear something around your neck and your face to protect your face because that gets really hot. It's like having a really bad sunburn. So important clothing is very key. This is one of the tools that we use sometimes for prairie burns or even um, forest, prescribed forest burns. This is called a drip torch and it's a lot of fun to use. I got to use it at one of the burns I helped with. So this is a, like a big container and it has certain kind of fuel in there. And then when you tip it down, the fuel goes through that curly Q hose, kind of like sometimes those funny hoses that your kids might drink from. And then you light the tip of this uh, um, like uh, straw, and then it will drip out fire like this firefighter is showing you here. And it is really cool and also very weird to be dripping fire. So this is used for starting the fires is one of the ways. Here are a couple of tools that you use for um, controlling sparks that might get away from you. 
So this tool here on the left hand side is called the flapper. It's like a, a kind of flexible piece of rubber. And instead of the way using it the way the name says, a flapping, you don't want to flap or fan the fire because that adds more oxygen to the fire. You really use it more for smothering sparks that might have sparked the wrong way. So the flapper is used for smothering, not for flapping. The picture on the right here is showing a water backpack. And this is used for also for controlling sparks. In wildland firefighting and prescribed burns, we don't use a whole lot of water because it's just so heavy. And in wildland firefighting, you may not have access to water. So we don't use a whole lot of water like structural firefighters do. But let me show you how the water backpack is used. So the, the orange line there represents using the drip torch to light the fire. We want the fire to go um, away from us where we're taking the picture. So we got some fire there. And then um, maybe some sparks have come towards us. That's that little squiggly line, orange line towards us. And you can use the water backpack just to spray down on that one side, just those sparks that have gotten away from you. You're not going to use it uh, a whole lot because water is very heavy to carry very far. So how is a burn conducted? Let's look at a sort of oversimplified version of how it's done. So let's pretend this is the area that we want to burn. We have um, the brown area is where the prairie grass is have grown from last year. They're still there. They kind of matted down by the snow and rain and wind. And we have green grass that might be a trail that's mowed around there. Um, it could even be a gravel trail that works too. Um, so this is what we call a fire break. So our fire break is to keep the fire from jumping somewhere else. Uh, the wind direction is coming from the west as indicated from in the arrow there. So we're going to start our burn on the far right side. So we're going to use that drip torch to start a line of fire very close to the actual edge of the area. And the reason we're starting the fire here is because if we get this area to burn here and the wind is coming from the left hand side towards the right, once this area here has burned out, the fire is really not going to creep too far to the left by itself because of the way the wind direction is coming. So once that area has burnt out, the fire might go out by itself. And we want to do this in stages so that if the weather conditions change, you can easily shut the fire down. It's more difficult to do if uh, this fire has not been done in smaller sections. So then we'll start another fire uh, line with the drip torch, burn that area. Then we'll burn that area into it's just gray and burnt out. And then we'll keep doing that until we've burnt the entire area. It depends on how large this area is. It might take all day or it might just take a few hours. It depends on how large of an area you're burning and the weather conditions and how your team's doing. But sometimes we can't do prescribed burns because of the weather conditions are not right. And we actually haven't been able to do a burn at McLeod Nature Park since 2016. So there are some ways of uh, dealing with the trees and shrubs that come up in your prairie when you can't do a burn. So one of the alternatives is to mow. With a large mower like this one here, you can mow that uh, tall grass, you can mow into those small trees and shrubs that have been coming in, and that can do some of the same thing as prairie burns. Uh, it will chop up those organic materials and release it back into the soil, but it's slower than if we burnt it and just had ash there. You can also use grazing of sheep or goats. This is another alternative, although they might not want to chew everything in your area. So you have to do some um, special types of grazing techniques with movable, movable fences. But that is a way of um, getting around when you can't do a prescribed burn. Uh, they will also naturally fertilize your area. Um, well, when uh, they've converted those grasses into uh, natural fertilizer. 
you also might want to do some natural or some selective removal of trees and shrubs with cutting of those trees and shrubs you may need to use some herbicide to keep that from coming back especially some of those more aggressive uh, species we don't haven't done a lot of burns in years past uh, just overall in the nation and I think a lot of it is because of Smoky Bear. Now, I love Smoky Bear, and I bet you do too. So Smoky Bear was created in 1944, and the phrase, the slogan was, only you can prevent forest fires. In World War II, fires were occupying men who should be working in the war effort, and Smoky Bear became part of the war effort to keep men occupied with the war at the time. Smokey is based off of a real bear, actually after the symbol came first. So in 1950, a bear cub was actually found in a fire in New Mexico, and this bear was uh, nursed back to health and um, named Smokey Bear after the symbol. Smokey Bear, the living bear, lived in a DC zoo until 1975. So Smokey Bear's um, slogan promoted fire suppression, and this prevented all fires, which led to fuel buildup, and this leads to massive fires. We've seen some of these pictures from out west that are really scary, and this no fires allowed is worse than occasional fires. So now, Smokey Bear's updated phrase is only you can prevent wildfires, meaning non-prescribed fires. So allowing prescribed fires with proper training and planning, it will prevent some of those big scary fires. But again, conditions have to be right to allow for those prescribed burns. So sometimes it's really hard to get those uh, done. So hopefully you've learned a little bit about prescribed burns. Hopefully you'll remember that fires are needed, they're useful, and they're historic. Prescribed fires can be done safely. And if the next time you're visiting McLeod Nature Park and you do notice a little bit of burned area in the prairie, you'll remember that this was done for the health of the prairie and the prairie will recover very quickly and will be healthier because of it. So visit HendricksCountyParks.org for more program information and be sure to ask us questions that you might have about prairies and we hope to see you again very soon. Thank you.